Hi, I'm Gary Parker. I'm the Deputy Director of the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research at NYU's Silver School of Social Work. At the McSilver Institute, we are committed to creating new knowledge about the root causes of poverty, developing evidence-based interventions to address its consequences, and rapidly translating new knowledge into action through policy and practice. The McSilver Institute recognizes the interconnectedness between race and poverty, and we are committed to dismantling structural racism and all forms of systemic oppression. And this is Degrees of Freedom. It's a series where we meet with leading service providers, policymakers, elected officials who are making great strides in addressing uh, the needs and improving the lives of poverty impacted populations. And today, my guest is Councilwoman Rosie Mendez. First elected in 2005, she was previously the Chief of Staff to her predecessor, Councilwoman Margarita Lopez. But she started as an activist working on tenants' rights. She went on to law school, worked at the Brooklyn Legal Services, where she advocated on behalf of tenants for their housing and social welfare issues, and has been a fearless champion of housing rights and of oppressed populations within the New York City Council. She's an activist not only within her local neighborhood, but within the Puerto Rican community and the LGBT community. So it is my great pleasure to welcome to Degrees of Freedom, Councilwoman Rosie Mendez. Rosie, hi. hi. How are you? I'm doing great. It is so great to have you here, and I'm so grateful for you to making the time to come and join us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Of course. So I want to dive right in. You know, and I want to talk a little bit about poverty. And you know, at the McSilver Institute, we really take a structural approach and look at poverty, at the kind of systems that are holding children and families and communities into multi generational poverty and less the kind of individual responsibility perspective that says that if you're poor, it's really your own fault, which we know is not the case. And I wanted to ask you, so how, how do you think the city council is doing in really understanding the root causes of poverty from this using this kind of structural lens? I, I think um, a lot of it comes to us in various ways, right? Mm -hmm. One is from our own constituent cases mm -hmm. and where we notice patterns and trends. Yeah. Um, two is from the public hearings that we hold mm -hmm. and the information that we gather from the public, from advocates, and from the agencies. And uh, three is, you know, as New Yorkers, we take a look around, we see things, we read, and we take all that to inform our decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I think on, on the city council level, while I've been there, what we have tried to do is to, of course, you know, as legislators, make laws that can rectify some of these inequities. Yeah. Um, but where, you know, we can't pass the law quick enough, or sometimes, you know, it's a matter of enforcement, so yeah. you're not going to see change right away. What we've been doing is creating initiatives yeah. to address areas that we see um, are social stigmas, uh, social problems that also um, influence and uh, you know uh, poverty or keep people in poverty. Sort yeah. of like uh, sometimes domestic violence, yeah. um, homelessness, you know, issues like that, and then figure out ways that we can put funding. Yeah. on a year-to-year -year basis to address those needs. And what would, you, what would you consider like your biggest success in that particular area, something that you've been particularly proud of? Hmm. One of the things I've championed as a former legal services lawyer is to provide more funding for legal services. Yeah. Um, so we've worked really hard on that to keep the funding in place and to keep funding for what we call the legally indigent. So you may not be at the federal poverty level, yeah. but you don't make enough money in the city to hire a lawyer, and um, mostly for housing problems. And we've created an initiative, was created prior to me getting into the council by my um, predecessor and a few others, and so we fund that as well. So I think for me that has been very important. And then personally the work that I've done on public housing, yeah 
as the chair of what was then the subcommittee, and then it became a full committee, and as a, pu a former public housing resident, you know, just feeling like, for me, public housing, you know, helped me get an education, mm -hmm. helped my family escape poverty, mm -hmm. um, and it was a great place to live in, not so much anymore, yeah. um, but ensuring that public housing exists so that um, people have an affordable home and can hopefully pull themselves from their bootstraps and get out of poverty as my family did. You know, there's been a lot of research done on housing and this kind of housing first model, mm -hmm. which says that if you get a family or an individual housing first, mm -hmm. that the other issues that are impacting that family will be able to ad be addressed subsequently. But without the stability of housing, which you just described mm -hmm. was a great kind of springboard to to the things that you've been able to accomplish um, it's much harder to kind of to to pull yourself up out of poverty I, I agree you yeah. know when I look at my constituents um, if they're homeless their health is declining if they have health problems they can't stabilize themselves um, they end up in hospitals emergency rooms doubled up tripled up if they're lucky doubled up or tripled up yeah. um, uh, the, the kids that I see in the homeless shelters that are in my public schools, um, it is harder for them to get appointments for doctors, their parents are running around, you know, um, it's harder for them to get stabilized and, you know, sometimes they may sh change you from one shelter to another and you've yeah. already established a relationship with the school. Yeah. Some of the parents are traveling sometimes because they get moved let's say, to a shelter in the Bronx, and they'll travel from the Bronx back to the Lower East Side because yeah. they want to at least try to maintain the stability that the school is giving the child. Right. You know, recently I did a um, program that I fund, and what I do is I take my Title I schools where there's the most poverty, mm -hmm. and it used to be called Computers for Youth, Power My Learning. And so, uh, we fund them and we put them in my Title I schools and then they go on a weekend and they do a big training on computers, yeah. how to you know, surf the internet, how to use um, Word and Excel uh, for the entire family. Yeah. Um, and on the parents, they teach them how to put restrictions on the computer mm -hmm. and then at the end of the day, the kids walk away with the computer and they wow. get to keep it. And um, and there were a few kids from the shelter who left with the computer, and I thought, I hope that they'll be able to keep it, you know, yeah. that they're stabilized enough, and from here they go into a permanent housing where they can keep that computer, because if they keep moving from another shelter to another, you know, you start to get rid of some of the things that right. you can't carry or keep with you. Right, so. right. And, and another one of the issues, that, so, so first it's so, amazing that you have worked so hard over so many years to really ensure that the communities in the Lower East Side and the East Village and parts of East Midtown are getting the resources that they need in order to kind of live these fulfilled lives. One of the challenges, um, not just in your district, but throughout the city, is the, is the issue of gentrification. And I know that you've been working very hard on a lot of these housing issues, and I, I really want to kind of get your thought on, you know, how do you um, kind of provide these supports and develop communities without having it turned into this gentrification that then pushes out those that have the most need? That is a very hard thing. Yeah. So my friends who have been in the Lower East Side and East Village for decades before me, um, when um, you know the Lower East Side was burning and there were empty buildings and yeah. landlords would burn the buildings and take the insurance profits and walk away from the building, yeah. um, they started creating programs to renovate the buildings. They uh, started looking into laws to create a financial institution. We created. They created a credit union. I sat on the board at one point. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them were very clear that while this was necessary for the neighborhood, because the resources weren't there, so if they didn't create it, no one else would, mm -hmm. they were also clear that down the road, they were just going to be making this community attractive to other people to move in. Right. 
and and that's the downfall yeah. and you know and that's what's happened here yeah and you, you know you see it in in other communities east harlem you know washington heights and yeah. you can go into the other boroughs and see them as well yeah. uh, the community where i was born and raised williamsburg um go visit my parents i see it there all the time now with new buildings uh old buildings being demolished and then bigger buildings being put in uh, smaller apartments and uh, new people moving in who you know didn't live in the neighborhood and the people who live there can't afford to rent those new apartments right you know? right so there's still so much work to do on how we go about finding that right balance of revitalizing communities but without kind of pulling them apart at the same time not such an easy thing. Not such an easy thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Rosie, Councilwoman Mendez, for joining us today. I'm just so thank grateful, you. grateful to have been able to know you for so many years and grateful for you to take the time to spend with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Degrees of Freedom. <laughs>